One, two, three, four, five, six. If you're able, please stand as we sing our first song, Who You Say I Am. Stuart will be coming up to give the announcements. Well, good morning, Oak Hills Community Church. I have some special announcements for you that came, that burn it, I, that came to me via an email, and I have to read it off the email. Okay, two things. One, the newcomers class. If you look inside your bulletin, you'll see it on the right section outlined in blue. Uh, it is coming. We have a class for a Saturday morning, late October or early November. If you're interested in uh, seeing what that's all about, please contact Pastor Mark. And uh, if that sounds like something you want to do, then he will get you all signed up. Uh, the other thing he wanted me to bring up is an upcoming apologetic series. God has revealed himself through the word of God, the Bible. Yet many in our culture have doubts about God. Worse, some attack God's existence. The apostle Peter urged every Christian to be prepared to make a defense for our faith. And the word for defense is apologia. 1 Peter 3.15 to do this, we will begin a new series in September. This timely set of sermons will help strengthen the faith of believers and equip them to have answers to objections about God. 
You may know someone who is struggling with doubts or who would benefit from this series. Please consider inviting family and friends to attend. Thank you very much. That is Pastor Mark. Uh, other announcements. We have thank you, a big thank you to everyone who helped to mix, freeze, and bake 50 dozen cookies for the Kairos ministry. That's a lot of cookies. Yes. <laughs> Praise God for that. Let's see what else. And I think that's it. I think that's it. Did I welcome everybody? I did? No? Josh did? Well, I better. Welcome. Whether you are, <laughs> whether you are a longtime attendee of Oak Hills or this is your first time, it's a blessing to have you here to worship God with us. And I thank you for, for coming. And if there's nothing else that I have forgotten or misconstrued in my noggin, I apologize already. You guys okay? All right. I'm going to step down. I knew that wasn't in your email. It was in your text. That's what happens when you send me both an email and a text. All right, let me find the text. Hold on. Stand by. It wasn't in your text. Was it? Oh, it was in a text for, with you. Okay. Yes. Dan Richmond sent this today. Hello, Pastor Mark. Carrie and I would like to thank everyone for your generous outpouring of love stocking our pantry and fridge. Would it be possible to say a few short words to that effect this Sunday? Dan Richmond. Why, yes, it would. <laughs> That's it. Would you welcome Come on up please? here, Richmond's, <laughs> and rescue me. Well, yeah, we just wanted to uh, take a moment to say thanks. We were blown away by your generosity. And um, you don't even know, most of you don't even know who we are. So, you know, and our pantries were, our pantry was full of stuff, our freezer, our refrigerator. And yeah, we're really blown away by that. Thank you so much. Tuesday night, six o'clock, a little bit after we drove up to the house, we saw this big sign on the front, a very warm welcome to Texas. <laughs> it was. Our son and daughter-in-law and grandson were standing in front of the sign, and they motioned to us, you know, don't start unpacking yet. Come in, come in, come in. Uh, yeah, we were overwhelmed, almost to tears. Thank you. God bless you, each one. Okay, I guess we're done. All right. If y'all would like to stand with us again as we sing our next song, hear our praises.
Let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this privilege to come to you this morning with praise and now with our petitions of need. Our enemy is ever before us, and we bless you for your power to win the spiritual battles that we face. We thank you for spiritual leaders in this church and surrounding churches. Guide them as they lead and inspire us to please you. We have friends needing stamina as they struggle with cancer treat and its treatments. Christy, Janet, Lynette, and Jim. Grant them and their caregivers encouragement and mercy as they tend loved ones. We ask for strength for Susie as she cares for Jim. We bring Kathy to you asking for relief from stenosis in her lower back. Please, Lord, allow those injections bring healing and comfort. Cindy still needs stable housing provisions while dealing with major issues restoring her water-damaged home. And Marie needs her casita and coach sold, as well as wise financial counsel. Linda A. needs strength, her strength restored so she may return to her assisted living home. And Cindy, Kelly's cousin needs her breath restored to breathe and sleep well. 
She also needs your comfort as she grieves her mother leaving this earth. We praise you for the certainty of her reuniting with her in heaven. Gary's friend Jim needs his lung transplant to be accepted so that he may thrive and, and receive better health. Linda C. needs prayer for issues with her house. Please, Lord, may, may the um, estimator give her an honest re results. Lord, hold our military, police, firemen, in your strong and loving hands. Protect them, defend them as they protect us. Direct American citizens to carefully think about their vote choices this fall. And prepare teachers and students for a good, healthy year. Help us remember, Lord, your grace is sufficient. Your strength is perfect. Your plan is sovereign. We bring these requests to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Back in 1917, the Russian Orthodox Church was having their denominational meeting, and the bishops gathered, and there was a heated furor. They were having a great debate. You know what the debate was about? Candles. <laughs> Should they be 18 or 22 inches long? A few blocks away, there was another meeting that was going on. The Bolsheviks were meeting, planning to overthrow the Tsar. So while the church was arguing about candles, communism was getting its start. You know, I wish that such trivial matters didn't happen. And, and I'm just really glad to say that they haven't happened since. And they would never happen in America, and never in the church. I admit I'm being a little sarcastic. I wish I could say that truly, but I'm being sarcastic. In fact, the church has had squabbles just seeming like, like forever from the very foundation of the church. We're human, and we, we argue about things. But as the church argues, what happens? Well, Churches split, pastors resign, and the name of Christ is disgraced. Think about the things that we argue over. You know, whether to have chairs or pews, flags or no flags, um, whether to have organ or keyboards, whether to have drums or no drums. And we argue about issues that involve what we teach, like things like the timing of Christ's return or women in ministry or church government or other things. And to all these things and more, I can only say how trivial. How trivial. Chuck Swindoll says that he has examined many church splits and he said, never once have I found one that was over a truly essential issue. Now, there may be some that are, but generally the things we fight about are things like the color of the carpet. I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> Not in this church. All right. So please stay with me. Even if I've offended some of you over what I've said, please stay with me as we talk about this. And we look at Romans chapter 15, where Paul testifies that true unity demands sensitivity. I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. And here we see that Paul begins with challenging us to be others-focused. 
others focused. 15 verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Last week, we looked at chapter 14. We looked at the strong Christian and the weak Christian. And Paul challenges the strong Christians, though that understand they have freedom in Christ and can do many things as long as God has said, you don't do this or don't do that. We have the freedom to do these things. And one of the things God has given us freedom in is to choose what to eat. And so he uses an example. He talks about the strong Christian in, in that day had freedom to eat meat. And the weak Christian was vegan. And they had these differences. And he encouraged the strong not to condemn those that didn't realize they had the freedom to eat a good juicy steak. He, he, he says, you have the freedom, but don't abuse that freedom by condemning people that don't agree with you. I mean, we're going to disagree over various things, right? All kinds of things that are a matter of opinion. And so what Paul is challenging us today in this auditorium to accept one another. If somebody comes in and they're different than us, should we accept them? Absolutely. If somebody comes in and they have different opinions than we do, should we accept them? Absolutely. I love it that the body of Christ is made up of different nationalities, that it's made up of different people, young and old, rich and poor, all kinds of people. That's a beautiful mosaic. And I love that. And I don't want us to lose that quality. So let's be accepting as people come in, or even people who have been here for a long time. Let's accept one another. Paul didn't want the fellowship to be broken and the unity in the church to be fractured. And one way for us to accomplish this is for strong Christians, Christians that know we have freedom, to be willing at times to limit our own freedom so as not to offend others. It's fascinating to me, this, this idea, kind of use the illustration of to eat meat or not, he spent a whole chapter on that, chapter 14, we saw last week. And he's not done yet. Here in chapter 15, he's kind of continuing that thought. This is important to Paul. This is a cornerstone of Christianity to accept one another. The ancient Stoics used to teach that there were many things that they called adiaphora that is indifferent. It was neither right nor wrong. It was just a matter of preference. And they had a saying that went like this. It's not right or wrong. It just depends on the handle that you pick it up with. <laughs> I think he's right. I think they're correct. To a student of art, a certain picture might be a work of art. To another person, it might be an obscene drawing. I traveled to Israel and studied in Israel at the Institute in Jerusalem, American Institute. And then I came back and we scheduled a stop in Paris and there was no extra charge. So I scheduled a layover in Paris and I was, I was traveling with a Christian couple, an elderly Chinese couple. And he would not go to the Louvre Museum because of nude statues. Others chose to go to the Louvre and, and they took pictures of the Venus de Milo. One group of people, for them, a discussion might be intriguing, something to really debate about, and they're really into it. And to another person, that might be a bunch of heresies. An amusement, a pleasure, a hobby might seem quite permissible to one and prohibited to another. The thing is neither right or wrong, it's just determined by the opinion of the one who sees it. Some people enjoy playing a sport on Sunday or watching sports on Sunday. To another person, that might be a wrong thing. They, can view, they view the Sabbath as holy and you don't do that. 
I had missionary friends that encountered that in Guatemala. And to take a weaker Christian, somebody that doesn't know they have the freedom to do something, and to try to push them to do that, to engage in this sport, say soccer on Sunday, which they think really is wrong, really is against the law of God, to force them or try to get them to do that would to be causing them to engage in something that all through the time they'd be saying, wow, I really shouldn't be doing this. I really think what I'm doing is against God. Do you see my point? We want to accept each other and we don't want to push others to agree with us in everything, to be in lockstep in things that are of no matter to God. You know, if we push them to do that, that's not accepting them, is it? Paul encourages stronger Christians to welcome such people and not to bombard them with criticisms. And it's not limited to Paul's day. It's true for struggles today as well. You know, it might be easy to show somebody ir quick irritation because they disagree with us on something. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Accept one another. Now, verse 2. Paul lays down a principle. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. What if we all did that? Think of what the world would be. No warfare. Because everyone's looking out for the welfare of others. What if our nation did that? No setting one group against another. Everyone would care for each other. All would respect one another. And anger and hate would disappear. What if our area did that? You know, everybody looking out for each other. No road rage. <laughs> People in neighborhoods would get along. But these things will not happen. You know why? Because man is sinful and separated from God. Mankind are born with a rebellious heart and live out our lives in rebellion. So that will not happen in this world. But what if we Christians live that way? What if we accepted one another as Christ has accepted us? Maybe it might motivate some people to grow. You know, take the next step in Christ. Take the next step to maturity. They might be motivated. You know, if people feel like they're rejected, they're not motivated, are they? If, if we laugh at what they hold dear regardless of what it is, and we mock them, they're not going to be motivated to grow. But if we accept them as individuals, we don't have to agree with them in everything. But if we're kind to them, neighborly, loving our neighbor, then they may be encouraged to take the next step, maybe to learn more about Christ and want to trust in him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people met us and they saw how we interact with one another as Christians and they say, they're different. How do they get to be that way? I want what they've got. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Well, here's a question for you. When is it right to please men and when, it is, when is it wrong? The solution to this problem is very simple. It's found in the alternative to pleasing men. So here's the answer to that. When we must choose between pleasing others and pleasing ourselves, it is right to please others. Put others first. But when the choice is between pleasing others and pleasing God, pleasing others is wrong. Doesn't that make sense? 
If God has revealed his will and you know what God's will is and somebody wants you to please them by doing something else, you know, say they uh, want you to go to the corner and meet a guy there and buy him some crack cocaine. <laughs> you know, when it comes to pleasing God, that's supreme. There's a reason why Christ said, love God first and then love others. So if it's pleasing to God, let's do it. If it's not pleasing to God, we place him first. Bob Deffenbaugh summarized this very well. This is what he said. Before considering what Paul does say, what Paul does say about pleasing others, let's note what he did not say. He has not said that we should please our neighbor in any way our neighbor dictates. We are to please our neighbor as God dictates. We are not instructed to make our neighbor feel good about himself, to make him comfortable, to fulfill his desires or expectations. God is the one who defines what is pleasing to our neighbor, not our neighbor. As we shall soon see, doing what is pleasing to our neighbor may not please him at all. Paul is speaking about pleasing in a long-term, eternal sense, not in a short-term way. So, if we are to please our neighbor in a way that promotes his good, we're doing it for a spiritual purpose, trying to accomplish spiritual ends. And Paul wants us to get there. He wants uh, to bring out now his heavy artillery to motivate us to do this. What is that heavy, heavy artillery? Jesus Christ. <laughs> we are commanded to be imitators of Christ. Look at verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Christ did not please himself. What an understatement. You know, judging from ministers today, ministry means having your own personal private jet. I can't fly with the riffraff. <laughs> Was that the way that Christ operated? No, he, he, he got involved with people. He, he helped them wherever he could. And sometimes it was subjected to people that, that just opposed him at every turn, argued with him, started to plot against him. When he, he was not falling into their trap, they said, the only way we're going to deal with this guy is we're going to have to kill him. And so they began to plan that. Little did they know they were fulfilling God's plan when they did that. In eternity past, God planned for his son to be the redemption price for us. Bulls and goats weren't adequate. A perfect sacrifice was necessary. They seized him. They had a mock trial. The soldiers spit on him. They placed a crown of thorns, and the thorns in the Middle East are between one and two inches long. They wove a crown of thorns, placed it on his skull, and then took a stick and beat it into his skull. Imagine if this were you, having your hands and your feet pierced with rough Roman nails. And then being lifted up and having the entire weight of your body suspended only on those wounds. These are the things that Christ endured to pay the redemption price necessary for God to redeem us. And purchase our eternal destiny in heaven with him. Beautiful thing, but at great cost. Let us recognize the magnitude of what Christ did for us. And what he endured, he endured for us. That we might have a relationship with God that is free of guilt, eternal, and full of hope. 
Now look at verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Remember in Luke chapter 14, the Pharisees felt that Jesus was not keeping the Sabbath properly. They felt their laws governed how this commandment to keep the Sabbath was, was carried out. And Christ wasn't submitting to their laws. He wasn't disobeying God, but he was not complying with people's man-made laws. And he didn't do that. Why not? Well, probably because if he had submitted to that, they would have never understood things that he needed to teach them. Like they would have never understood the real purpose of the Sabbath. It wasn't something that was made to earn credit with God. I'm keeping the Sabbath, therefore I deserve heaven. You know, we're not saved by our works. And he doesn't follow their plans. But then on another occasion, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, hey, Lord, you know, people are complaining. They're saying you're not paying the tax. So Peter is called to Jesus, and Jesus says, Peter, I want you to go to a, the river, and I want you to catch a fish. And the first fish that you catch, look in its mouth. And in its mouth, you'll find a coin. And that coin will be just enough to pay the, the temple tax for you and for me. So on this occasion, he did comply with what others wanted. Why? Well, he tells us, so that they will not be offended. Jesus is teaching truth. He didn't want to offend others. And so he complies. He submitted to their requirements. Did it in a miraculous way. Isn't that a cool way? But he submitted to them. Well, the Old Testament helps us here, especially in matters of yielding up our rights. Yielding up our rights. Remember, when Abraham and Lot were together and their herds got so vast that they couldn't coexist together, you know, they're overgrazing and so the herds were having problems and the, the shepherds were fighting each other. And so Abraham and Lot realized they've got to separate. Now, Abraham is the uncle. He's the senior guy, the older. He has every right to have first choice at where in the promised land. But he gave up that right. Just like sometimes God is going to ask us to give up our rights. He gave up that right. He says, Lot, you choose. <laughs> well, Lot looked up and he saw the valley that was lush and green, perfect place for grazing. And he says, that's what I want. And Abraham gave it to him. And Abraham took the higher desert ground. He didn't get the best place. He gave up his right. And that's against human nature, isn't it? But sometimes God may want us to yield to another person. Remember Moses? According to the record, he gave up his place as prince of the household of Pharaoh. As Hebrews tells us, he gave it up in order he might suffer reproach with the people of God for a season. What a beautiful example. Or David and Jonathan love this story. These two friends that are like-minded, love the Lord, and they bonded together as friends. Two military guys that were brave and they respected each other. But Jonathan was the son of the king, and the king is getting older now. And the king, when he dies, Jonathan's the right heir. But he recognizes something. Jonathan recognized God had a different plan. God's plan was to choose David. And so Jonathan yielded up his rightful place, gave it to David. And when his father wanted to kill David, he resisted that, endured the wrath of his father because he knew David was God's choice. Well, let's look at verse 5. May the God who gives endurance 
and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ had so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, what kind of attitude and action did Christ have? Servant. Servant. I had three things. Brother, you got, you got one of them. That's very good. Also, he was humble, right? He was, he was humble. He came as a servant. He yielded up his rights. That's the kind of attitude that is a model for us. That's what God wants us to be like, humble, servant people. And then he says, accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So what's the command? Accept one another as, as people normally do or as God does. He accepted us with our sin and faults, and he still loves us. And he'll never stop loving you. He accepted, God accepted us because of what Christ did. And he wants us to do that. But there's a purpose here. Did you notice what the purpose is? In order to bring praise to God. When you do this command, when you accept other people, looking past their differences and their opinions that you may not agree with, but when you accept them and love them, that brings praise to God. Have you thought about that? Wow, that's what the text says. Literally, it says the glory of God. It brings God glory. So the model of the acceptance is the Lord Jesus Christ who accepted us. The Lord received believers when they were not only powerless, but also ungodly sinners and enemies. Certainly Christians can receive others who are different in non-essential areas. Now the aim should be upbuilding, building up. You know, the picture of a church as a building is, is common in the New Testament. And we're not talking about the building. God has given us a building. We give him praise for that. But God is far more interested in people. He's far more interested in you. And he describes us as being a building. You know, us together form building. And each individual is look like, looks like a stone. And you have stone upon stone upon stone. And we support one another. Scripture tells us that anyone who destroys God's building, the church, God will destroy. I see that as like some kind of physical punishment. I would not want to be that person. And I think about church splits have been so ugly over such trivial things, and it destroys a church. Actually, sometimes it multiplies churches. You get two. You know? Somebody said that's our favorite way of planning churches, a good church split. <laughs> but we don't want to displease God by creating unnecessary strife. Now, he gives an example, one that was really common in Paul's day, and it's, it's common today as well. Note the Jew-Gentile rift, the great division between Jew and Gentile. Gentile being, it's an idea for Greek, but just any non-Jewish person. What Paul is saying here is that God is already working out this great program in which these two people that have hated each other for centuries are now being brought together as one. We are the church comprised of Jew and Gentile. I mean, that must have shook their categories. And this has already started in Paul's day, and it's going on today, and it is based on the fact that Christ accepted both Jew 
and Gentile and put us in one body. Now, I don't know if you've ever been involved in a church fight. You know, people fight over all kinds of things, but it can get very hot. I remember in a previous church seeing this conflict and we were at a table and, and one person was saying bad things to the other and the other person was getting so angry, they're gripping the table. And then one person started to rise up and the veins in his neck were bulging out. I saw that. I never want to see that here. And I hope you will all agree to work hard to get along with each other so that kind of thing never happens here. Now, there are things we're going to have to stand for. We're going to stand for the Word of God. We're going to stand for truth. We're going to stand for Jesus Christ. We're going to share the gospel. We're going to do good. We're going to stand for those things. We're not going to compromise on those things. But on non-essential essential issues, let's accept one another and love each other. You know, those, those people back in that day, they hated each other. The Jews hated the Gentiles. They called them dogs. They wouldn't even go in a Gentile house. They would not eat with a Gentile. In the book of Acts, God calls Peter and says, I want to show you something, Peter. He lowers this thing and he says, Peter... Arise and eat, you know. And he, he sees these foods that the Jews have called unclean based on Old Testament law. But Christ declared all things clean, all foods clean. So anyway, he tells Peter, arise and eat. And Peter says, no way, Lord. And, and this happens three times. And he still doesn't get it. <laughs> and then he gets a call to go to a house. Acts chapter 10, the centurion, Cornelius. And he goes to the house, and they've been waiting for Peter to come with the message of the gospel so they can be saved. They've been waiting and praying, waiting for Peter. And Peter shows up, and is he going to go in the house? He realizes God is showing them that God has a new plan. And he goes in the house, and he shares the gospel, and they come to faith in Christ. Great moment. You'd think when Peter goes back and he joins back with his Jewish people, everybody would be excited. Man, that's great. They didn't. Peter, you did what? You went where? With who? You ate with them? Church fight starting. <laughs> and they understand as Peter explained to them how God had revealed to them that he had declared them clean and and the gospel was to go beyond Jewish boundaries. The gospel was to go to the entire world. They finally began to get it. Well, Jesus went to the Jewish people. And he put himself under restrictions he did not have to be put under. He left heaven. That's the big thing. But he lived life as a Jewish person. And to the Jew, they didn't understand the freedom that Christ was bringing in his ministry. He declared all foods clean. I've mentioned that. Everything is now clean. That they can, they can enjoy that. But Christ didn't want to offend. And he lived under the Jewish rituals so as not to offend. He limited his freedom to try to win others. Think about it. He never had a ham sandwich. He never had bacon and eggs for breakfast. Now, he declared all foods clean. He could have. But the Jews would have just been offended and never listened to him after that. He limited his freedom so he could reach more for Christ. Hopefully, we'll be like that. Now, the next paragraph, which kind of sums up this passage, Paul is going to quote extensively from the Old Testament. 
And what he's going to show them is you may think this is a new thing, Jew and Gentile, but God had it in mind all along. And basically, he's saying, be restored. He's talking about the Jew-Gentile rift. Verse 8 gives the principle. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. You know, way back in Genesis chapter 12, Paul calls Abraham out. But from the very beginning, he tells him, I'm going to give you this blessing and this blessing, but you're going to be a blessing to the whole world. And I think he had in mind the fact that Christ would come through his line. And you're going to bless the whole world. So Paul now uses this Old Testament, uses the Old Testament to show God has always had a plan to include the Gentiles. Verse 9, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And the Jewish people said, what? <laughs> As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. In verse 10, again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people, you know, Jew and Gentile together. That was always God's plan. God called the Jews, but he called them to be a, a light to the Gentile world. He called the Jewish people to have a covenant relationship with God so that the world could see what it was like to live in harmony with God. They didn't do very good, but that was God's intent. I'm not sure, did I do verse 10? Yeah, okay, verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. In verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. One who will arise to rule over the nation, speaking of Christ, in him, the Jews what does it say? In him, Gentiles will hope. Yeah. If it was God's plan to reconcile Jew and Gentile and have them bring glory to God, it had to take tremendous courage and drive to overcome their natural hatred for one another. For them to accept one another was like reconciling Jew and Arab or marriage partners who have come to hate each other, or Republican and Democrat, or like two local brothers who had a falling out in their business that they co-owned. One day, I was driving down 377 coming up to work, and and I saw a car parked on the side of the road, and I saw a police car pulled up to it. Later that day, I heard that one brother had shot his other brother over the business. Friends, hatred brings bad results every time. We're called to do away with hatred even if it means we get less of the pie or if it means we give up something that we have a right to or it means we just place the other first, that's God's plan for us. Accepting others and doing good to them so that they may one day glorify God can be challenging. That's against human nature, but it is our mission. Some of us may not like that mission. Some of us may say, man, I, I want plan B. But there is no plan B. You are God's plan. And his purpose includes us reaching out with the gospel and living out the gospel in such a way they see that we are different and they see that we love other people. So, love like Christ. 
That's Paul's challenge. Now, Paul places a benediction here of all places. He's got two more chapters. It's kind of a surprising place. Here's the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in some ways, the book of Romans ends with this verse. This kind of sums up his grand message to the Roman people, the Roman church. Now, he will go on in chapter 15, he's 16. In chapter 15, he'll talk about making plans. And we'll talk about that next time. And then in chapter 16, he gives all sorts of uh, hellos to people and greetings. Shows how relational Paul was. But in essence, the argument of Romans ends here. This grand argument. And he ends with this benediction. I'll say it again. Listen to the words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy. Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Our Father, we do thank you for the peace and joy and righteousness that are gifts to us from your Spirit who is at work in our hearts. Thank you for the liberty and freedom that you have given us in these areas. We pray that we who regard ourselves as strong may be willing to bear the burdens of the weak and not offend them or to hurt them or to slash at them. May love be evident among us, Lord. But above all else, we pray that we may manifest a spirit of unity to the watching world that knows no way of to get divergent factions together. We thank you for this miracle of unity among us and ask that it be preserved in the name of the Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Now, I came across a, a slide that I wanted to include. Would you put that next slide up? And I'd already finished the message, but I so wanted to get it in. I couldn't figure out how to fit it into the rest. So I put it here at the end. All right. It simply says, we are one in Christ. Would you say that with me, please? We are one in Christ. May it always be that way. Please rise, please rise if you're able as we stand and sing our final song, Amazing Grace.
Thanks, Joshua, music team. On Friday mornings, I meet together for breakfast most weeks with a group of guys, oh, in their 40s, and they're all military people. I'm, I'm the only one that's not military. Thanks for letting me join you guys for that. And uh, we went over some verses, and we found a neat verse, and John challenged me to use this as the benediction today. So here it is, 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Great words. You're dismissed. <laughs>